effectively, the mainstream culture prioritizes matter because it prioritizes things. And hence my title, The Matter with Things. The way you see the world is wrong. And when it has to decide what the heck consciousness is, it imagines it must emerge from things, from matter. And of course, uh, a brain is material. And a brain certainly seems to run in parallel with consciousness. Uh, when things happen to the brain, they affect consciousness. There's no question about it. That's been known for a couple of thousand years. But the assumption that matter leads to consciousness is no better grounded, in fact, I would argue less well grounded than the idea that consciousness gives rise to matter. There are three possibilities indeed that matter emits consciousness, um, that it transmits consciousness, or that it permits consciousness. And in this, it's like a TV set. If an alien were to land in this world and to inspect a TV set, uh, it wouldn't be able to tell whether it transmitted something or generated something because the machinery would look the same. Now, I, in brief, I haven't got time to do the argument, but I can argue that easily the least probable of these is the idea that matter in some form emits consciousness. Um, First of all, we haven't the slightest clue. Nobody has even the vestige of a clue how matter could give rise, unconscious matter could give rise to consciousness. And as Walter, uh, sorry, not Walter, William James um, uh, pointed out, it's rather like a story in Midship and Easy, a 19th century novel in which a woman who's had um, an illegitimate child excuses it by going, but if you please, sir, it's a very little one. The idea that there might be a very little consciousness uh, before consciousness, as it were, just the kind of ghost of consciousness about to be, doesn't help us, because either it's conscious or it isn't. And if it's conscious in any degree, the same problem uh, exists. It's not like things that emerge. It's not like flow emerging from H2O molecules. There's something about the chemistry of H2O molecules that we know predicts that they will flow when there are mass of them. But there is nothing about the nature of matter that says that under any circumstances, it can give rise to consciousness. So um, there's an awful lot to say, but the first thing is that um, neurons are not necessary for consciousness. And there are cases of people who have certainly almost no cortex, whatever, um, of, uh, and yet are able to function at a simple level. And there's a case of, um, a chap who got a first class degree in mathematics from Leeds um, and had an IQ of um, nearly 130 um, uh, and was uh, found to have only a tiny rim of brain, very, very much smaller than, um, than the normal brain. Um, and as I say, there are people who are, um, have a very special, unusual condition um, in which they don't have cerebral cortex at all, and yet they can recognize people, they can behave socially, they can enjoy music, uh, and so forth. And people think that it, I, I never got this argument, but people say things like, well, it emerges out of all the connections. Well, yes, that's fine. It's slightly like the idea that if you just put more and more notes together, magically notes will do something. But it's, it's actually more than that. It's, it's something to come out of the notes. It's the form. And the form is not actually in the notes at all. So the form is not in the connections. One thing that I find very striking, you probably know, is that the cerebellum, the ancient part of the brain, uh, at the posterior part of the, of the brain, has four times as many neurons as the cerebrum, the part which maintains consciousness for us. And it's not that they're not very interconnected. They have some of the most sophisticated and most interconnected cells in the human body, Purkinje neurons. So it simply isn't a case of multiplying connections because nobody has been conscious just with a cerebellum. And we now can see that plants can make decisions, can respond to situations, situations that they couldn't have been prepared for. Um, if anybody wants to ask me about them, I can describe experiments, but I probably haven't got time at the moment. But 
um, two rather interesting insights into, into what I'm saying are that so vital are some organs to creatures that the, the sense of the loss of them causes them to generate them even when they don't have the gene for it. So you can breed eyeless flies by deleting the gene for eyes and their offspring have no eyes and you carry on. After 14 generations, they have eyes, but they don't have the gene. And it, even more astonishingly is that a certain um, cili uh, certain um, ciliate organism, you can uh, remove the gene for the flagellum. And I have been told that even in a matter of days, it will generate a new flagellum, even though it now doesn't have the gene for it. Now, I'm not a geneticist, but this is what I'm reporting. And, and perhaps I've got time just to tell you the fun experiment about plants, because um, let's start with a simple one. Um, a sensitive plant, Mimosa pudica, um, is designed to close uh, if it's touched. And if you stroke the leaf, it will close. If you carry on doing that and it doesn't experience any harm, it will stop doing it. You might say, well, yes, it's fatigued. But if you drop a drop of water on it, which is different from a touch of a finger, it can tell the difference and it closes because it detects danger. So it's not straightforward. And here's something really remarkable. You can grow pea shoots <coughs> in a circumstance in which they are craving light. And light can come to them down one arm or another of a Y-shaped tube. And the plant will get more light if it grows towards the tube down which the light is going to come. But the clever experimenter randomly varies it. But what the experimenter does is to send a puff of air down the tube sometime before the light is going to go on. And there are two sets, well, three, including a control. But in one experimental set, the advent of the puff of air means light will come down that same arm of the Y out of which the air came. In the other experimental setup, it's the other way around. When you experience the puff of air, the light is not going to come down that particular arm. And the plant is able to be trained in a quite short space of time to detect the air first and know that that's where the light is going to come from and grow towards the light. Uh, there are many other things. I mean, there's a whole literature on this, but the very idea that plants, which of course have no neurons at all, um, can't be conscious of things seems to me wrong. And we now know more and more about uh, very simple brains. I mean, the, the, the brain of a crow or a magpie is something of which humans may be frightened. They can do things that um, quite clever children can't do in terms of calculation, working out what's going on. And they have no neocortex at all. And the whole size of the brain is minute. Um, mind you, it's very profusely um, interconnected within itself, but there you are. It's an, it's an interesting observation. So well, I'd just like to end then with a, with a final few words. It seems to me that we've fallen under the spell of not just a way of thinking, but a way of being in the world, which is wrong. Um, we have a, a, a false set of values. And in the hierarchy of values that the philosopher Max Scheler drew up, at the base, there was the values of utility and the values of pleasure. And at the summit was the value of the holy. And in between, there was a, a level of what he called Lebenswerte, the sort of values of life, which were things like courage, um, magnanimity, fidelity, loyalty, uh, and those sort of things. And then above that um, was beauty, goodness, and truth. And then there was the holy. And it seems to me, um, and I say this in the Master in his Emissary, that the left hemisphere reduces all those higher things to a utility. The story is that the holy was invented so that priests could have a, um, um, a, a hierarchy, which literally is the, is the, um, the, 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 the uh, um, ascendancy of priests. Um, and that beauty, goodness, and truth are things that society needs in order to um, guide 
copulation and hold the um, society together. The Lebensvater are things that um, simple people do, uh, self-sacrifices for the value of the rest of the community, and that all in the end boils down to utility and pleasure. But I think the right hemisphere sees things in exactly the opposite direction, that things are useful in as, so much as they create something that actually gives to life and gives meaning to life, and that leads us to a place where we can experience beauty and goodness and truth, and ultimately the holy. And I'd like to suggest that whatever those terms mean, the meaning of a life comes from the journey towards them, whatever they are, and the effort to understand what they are and what they mean. And I don't think that we, as it were, give the meaning. We find the meaning. It's not an invention. It's a discovery. Well, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, Ian, thank you very much indeed. I, I like, I mean, Auf Hebung, you know, you, you want us to go up uh, to the hole and the holy rather than always going down to the, to the quantar or the grubs or the parts at the bottom. And you, and you end very, very strongly in that direction. 